Hi there. Hi. I'm just going to clean my hands first. Hi, I'm VJ Daniels, and I've been asked to examine you for something called heart failure. What's your name? Colin. Colin, nice to meet you. Um, so beginning the exam, we start off with general appearance, and the patient looks actually reasonably well, obviously in uh, hospital garb and whatnot, um, but he doesn't seem to be got increased work of breathing or excessively tachypnic. He seems to actually have good mentation, um, and his overall color looks good. Normally I would do vital signs next, but I've been asked not to do it. Uh, obviously blood pressure would be very important. Uh, if it's really high, it might be causing his heart failure. If it's really low, it could be a consequence of his heart failure. Um, I will actually do the heart rate, simply because if he was in atrial fibrillation, that could contribute to part of his problem. And so presuming I would have done it for 15 seconds, but I can estimate that it's actually normal rate and rhythm. Just going to be looking at the rest of his hands, see if there's any problems. Sort of normal temperature, normal cap refill, although well, it's not as specific here, but everything looks normal here. And then moving up to his brachial. He's got a nice brachial pulse, and everything seems good there. Chin up, please. I'm going to be examining his carotid. He has a very nice carotid pulse. Specifically looking at the amplitude and contour. It's a normal amplitude and contour. Again, if there was abnormalities, it might suggest a cause of his heart failure, like a valvular abnormality. And then while I'm palpating the carotid, I'm going to be looking at his JVP again. Could chin straight up and move it over? Now it looks like the head of the bed is around 30 degrees. And we'll start there and see if we can see it. And I can see the JVP very nicely there. It looks to be maybe a centimeter above the sternal angle, uh, which is normal in this position. It's certainly not elevated. Specifically looking for a double waveform, and it does look like there's a double waveform, and it looks like the first wave, A wave, that happens just before the carotid is the dominant. And as he takes a deep breath in, it looks like, or sorry, normal breath, it does look like it's descending in the neck. Because I am concerned about heart failure, even though it's at a normal point, I'm going to keep observing the JVP and do the abdominal jugular test. So while I look at the JVP, I'm going to push on the abdomen, and I see it does come up the neck, and wait for respiratory cycles or 10 cardiac cycles. And I can already see that it's come down nicely, so it's not a positive test. So now after doing so peripheral pulses, carotid, and JVP, I'm going to move to the precordial exam. Do you mind if I lower this? Okay, <clears throat> and then just exposing his chest, just going to look for any obvious scars or deformities and looking for any obvious impulses. You can sometimes see the apical impulse in thin people, which I think I actually can see right about there. Again, just making sure he doesn't have any other obvious impulses. And I do see another one up here, so I'll sort of palpate those to figure out exactly. Okay. And I'm going to start just quickly feeling for thrills. And of course, it's sort of hard to call them thrills until I hear a murmur, but I don't sort of feel anything there. And I did feel, yeah, right there. So just landmarking at the sternal angle. It's the second, third, fourth, fifth intercostal space. And the midclavicular line would be right about there. And yep, I can feel his... I'm just going to feel your carotid pulse at the same time. And they're basically instantaneous together, a nice tapping. So the location is appropriate, it's not sustained. And it feels to me smaller than a quarter, so it all seems to be appropriate. Technically I should feel it in the left lateral decubitus. Could you roll over please? Uh, it's a better measure of size. And again, still doesn't feel larger than a quarter. Okay, you can roll on back. So the only, there's no abnormalities. The normal finding is, again, the palpable apex with all the classic normal uh, features we would expect. Not suggestive of heart failure. If he did have uh, left-sided heart failure, you might expect a displaced apex. If the cause was pressure overload or valvular abnormality like aortic stenosis, you might get a sustained apex. Um, and it can also uh, be a larger apical impulse uh, in a dilated heart. So moving on to auscultation. 
Starting at the right upper sternal border, I'm just going to be listening for S1 and S2. And I hear S1 and S2 with S2 louder than S1 as it should be. And I hear the normal physiologic splitting on inspiration. And here in the left lower sternal border, S1's louder than S2. And over the apex, again, S1's louder than S2. And if he was in decompensated left heart failure, he might have the murmur of mitral regurg, which can happen with the volume overload. And he might have other murmurs suggesting a cause, but everything is normal here. But because I'm suspecting heart failure, I do want to listen with the bell in the left lateral decubitus. Can you roll over slightly again? Perfect, that's good. And sort of listening over the apex. Listening specifically for an S3, although given this is a young patient, I might hear it, and it would be normal in a young patient. And I don't appreciate an S3. I might hear an S4 if the problem is he's had a pressure overload condition or a previous heart attack, but there's no S4. And I also need this position to listen for the murmur of mitral stenosis, which I don't appreciate. Okay, you can roll back. Now, one other position I can listen is with the patient sitting up. Can you please sit up, please? Listening for the murmur of aortic regurg, which I might suspect if he had a bounding carotid pulse or if he had a wide pulse pressure. So listening in the left lower sternal border, for a decrescendo diastolic murmur. Can you lean forwards, take a deep breath, and blow it all the way out? And all the way out. And hold it. Great. Diastole is perfectly quiet, so he does not have the murmur of aortic regurg. Now, while he's sitting up, I can then examine his back, specifically for crackles, and although I'll get to uh, peripheral edema in a second, in patients who are bed bound, sometimes the edema can be in the sacrum. So I'm just feeling to see if there's any sacral edema, and there is not. Now I'm going to listen for crackles. Take a deep breath. Can you put your arms, hands on opposite shoulders? Like you're hugging yourself? Great. And breath in and out through your mouth. Again. 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 And again. And there are no crackles whatsoever. If he had crackles, I could also percuss to see if maybe he's got an effusion and do extra special maneuvers like tactile fremitus, but there's the, the chest is completely normal, so I'm not going to do that. Great, you can lie down. Now the abdominal exam is not usually part of the left heart failure exam, although if I found ascites, that would make left heart failure less likely because there's another cause of his swelling. But then I'm going to move down to his legs and just see if there's any peripheral edema. And there doesn't appear to be. Great. We can cover you back up. Put your arms in there. And that concludes the examination for left heart failure.